Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. My guest today is Michelle S. Weber. And this title of this interview is Tough Love, But Mostly Love. And I love that. And we're going to be talking about maintaining a sense of peace and groundedness in very unstable times. To be aware of how you treat people ethically, with kindness, to listen, to be non judgmental, to keep your side of the road clean. This is great stuff. So, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about uh, her, Michelle's business, which is a mindfulness based business. She encourages her clients to learn about mindfulness and to read up on spiritual authors and to work on being in the present moment without judgment and let me let me tell you this i've spoken to we, we were gonna have an interview a couple of weeks ago there was some faux pas but i already know her she is a very interesting person and i'm very much looking forward to this to this conversation as a matter of fact we were having a pre-interview conversation and i had to say michelle let's stop let's save this for the for the interview several times and with that ladies and gentlemen and everyone else michelle s weber hello michelle Hello, Tony. How are you today? Doing great. I mean, I tell you, you're such a fascinating person. And I think we have a great report because, you know, it's, I'm always titillated when I'm speaking with you. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, audience, she just, she's also an actor, which we have in common, though I don't do much acting these days. I'm focused on what I'm doing here, auxilium, changing the world with my automated coaching but she just got done with a job which uh where she worked with judge apatow's daughter as as, uh, as she was played her grandmother and uh there was some other either not big name but someone next to a big name that was involved in that conversation i can't remember it was, it was roxy sork and aaron's daughter that's it that's it. very good oh i'm so glad that you're here now let me tell the audience about you uh she is tough love but mostly love and I like that. You know, I'm the kind of guy, like I mentioned to you before, I'm an ex-paratrooper. I've been homeless in your home, in all, oh, not her hometown. She's in LA. She's from Connecticut, but she's in LA now. I've been homeless in LA. I've been around, you know, I'm a recovered addict uh, and I'm a tough love sort of guy. I like to throw someone in the deep, you know, the deep part of the pool so that they learn to swim and put a weight around their neck just for good measure. No, I'm only kidding about that second part. But, uh, you know, I, I really believe in tough love because, well, I don't want to get into that now, but tough love is still love. Don't be fooled. Just, you know, you can't kick. If you take the love out of tough love, then you're missing something. But if you just let people enable people, and they'll walk all, all over you, depending, you know. But people, we have a good and a bad side, each person. And, and when they feed the bad side a little bit more, which any, which any one of us can do, you know, then we, we might be wishing we had a little bit more tough love in, in the situation. Um, so more about Michelle <laughs> and less interruptions from me. She was born and raised in New Haven, Connecticut, and has had a private mindfulness-based practice based in LA. She is a psychotherapist, so she's no schmo. She's a psychotherapist. She's an addiction specialist, and uh, uh, you know something I can relate to very much. And by the way, you know, over the years, I, psychology is my favorite subject, Michelle. Over the years, I've considered going to school, getting my degree, becoming a therapist, or or some kind of psychologist. But I stopped having that intermittent thought a couple of years ago because I was sick of it, uh, of it coming up every time, and me putting it off because I decided, especially with the business that I'm doing now, creating this virtual coaching program, which is going to transform self-help that as an entrepreneur, I can help a lot more people in, in my specific circumstance, as opposed to a therapist who generally works one-on-one. -on -one. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, but I tell you, when I was a life coach, working one-on-one -on -one was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. It's just so awesome to help somebody, especially Having them have breakthroughs, oh, it's one of the greatest things. And she is a life coach. So a lot of people think, oh, life coaches, in, life coaches, some sort of one-off 
or not not to be taken seriously. More and more therapists, psychotherapists are also life coaches. They get into coaching because that's two sides of the same coin, more or less. And so she works with a diverse group of clients. She does individual therapy, couples counseling, those who are both struggling with drug use as well as recovering, and family therapy, including adolescents in crisis and LGBTQA+. Plus. Don't forget the plus. She has worked extensively with people in the entertainment industry. Michelle also works with HIV and AIDS clients, as well as people dealing with a variety of long-term chronic illnesses and pain issues that can take a huge physical and emotional toll. Michelle sees, uh, sees each client and family as an individual case working to understand their specific life situation, family dynamics and goals, as well as the things that are serving as obstacles to those goals. She is a high energy professional who helps her clients look at the factors that are holding them back and embrace the good in their life using humor. Oh, we're going to get into that uh, and help them move forward and encourage them to achieve their hopes and dreams for the future. Michelle, I love what you're about. Thank you. I see you've done your research, Tony. Uh, you, there, I mean, you know, there, we've got files on you, Michelle. We've got I can files tell, on you. I can tell. And nothing I'm worried about either because everything's ethical. Um, oh, yeah. I'll be the judge of that. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> See, uh, by the way, you know, this is an audio podcast, but we also put up a video on YouTube. You got to check out uh, Michelle's appearance. Uh, she's she's actually, she's very pleasant on the eyes and she has um, multicolored hair. I, I, I question if it's her natural color. Uh, you must check her out. She's a, <laughs> she's a very interesting person internally and externally, uh, but whatever, it's all good. So Michelle, I love what you're about. How long have you been out in LA now? I came out in 92. That's what, that's the year I arrived there. Whoa. And I came out because I had a job offer from this great East Coast Italian guy. I sent him a resume. He, I flew out and interviewed him. And I, when he hired me and he moved me out here, his name was Larry Gentile. He has since passed and I dearly miss him. But I said, and, oh, he hired me to run eight drug treatment programs all over L.A. Um, I was in Wilmington, I was in East LA, I was in Inglewood, I was everywhere, Compton. And when I was working for him initially, I said, how long after you met me, did you want to hire me, Larry? And he said, two and a half minutes, but you're a pain in the ass. I said, <laughs> that's why you hired me. <laughs> I know I could see that. I mean, I, I'm not saying anything negative about you. No, it was just, great. <laughs> Um, anyway, I worked for him for about six years and it was uh, wonderful. He was very outrageous, very brilliant. And we really had a wonderful relationship when he didn't like people and he ran huge, a huge corporation. And I ran his drug treatment programs, but when he didn't like people, he would call them shit for brains. And I go, Larry, stop. That's not nice. One day he said to me, you know what your problem is, Michelle? I thought, no, but you're going to tell me. So I'm going to tell you what your problem is. I said, what's my problem? He said, you're too kind. I said, I'll take it. Thank you very much. I said, I hope that's the worst thing I ever do is be too kind. Kill him with um, kindness. <laughs> um, but he, he was yeah. great. All right. Let, let me get to my first question. Okay. You work with couples. Yeah. How so? How so? How do you I work love, with first of all, I love working with couples. A lot of therapists won't work with couples because they get into it with each other. Yeah, it's, like, it's like herding cats. Yeah, you're right. And the thing is, I work mostly on communication. And I share with every couple this story or this kind of piece of information. Let's just say they're a heterosexual couple. I work with gay couples. I work with everybody. But so... He says something to her she doesn't like. Then she's so mad at him that she does the same thing back to him that she was angry about in the first place. And here we go. Right. Yelling and fighting and disagreeing. So I talk to them about communicating with each other, about taking that Zen moment, taking a breath. If someone says something to you that upsets you, take a breath and think, okay, now, this isn't easy. I mean, we have to practice this shit. We were never taught this growing up. You yell at me, I yell back. 
But see, I don't do that anymore. I've really changed the whole way that I live in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years because I've been studying mindfulness. But so I say to them, this is going to take practice. But if he says something to you that makes you uncomfortable, take a freaking breath and think, okay, is this going to be helpful how I respond? Is it going to make things worse? Do I tell him, look, I need a time out. I need to think about it. Whatever you can do. And one couple I'm working with, she called me during the week. I said, everything okay? She said, yeah, I just wanted you to know. We were starting to argue with each other. And I said to him, Jay, remember what Michelle said? I said, oh, thank you very much. I was in the middle of your argument. She said, no, we stopped. I said, terrific. So communication is the crux of every relationship. Absolutely, of everything. I mean, that is the critical thing. Yeah, parents and, and kids, sisters and brothers. I had a young woman call me to help me work through stuff with her mother. She was in her early 20s. She called her mother every name in the book. I said, okay, take a breath, let's work. And they just were not hearing each other. And she felt suffocated by her mom. And I always say to whoever I'm working with, if it's two people, there's an invisible line in the middle where you both need to meet. You will each be giving up something right. to get what you want. Right. The other thing I always do with couples is I say, first and foremost, what can you change that will help the relationship? Because in any relationship, if we make a small change, it changes the dynamics of the relationship and the way your partner works with you or hears you or listens to you. So they a each- Generative say, change. Yes. They each look at something that they think will help the relationship. And then eventually I say- Okay, what do you need from your partner? What would you like to see differently? So they start to listen to each other. Sometimes we're too busy, I'll... we're too busy reacting. <laughs> we're too busy reacting. Exactly. And... and that's about being mindful. It's about taking a breath. And if you feel angry, you can say, look, I'm feeling like this right now. Give me some time. One partner says, well, how much time does she need? I said, okay, we'll work that out. Five minutes, 10 minutes to walk around the block. What do you need? The thing is too, if there's alcohol or any other drugs involved, you don't get anywhere. And I have informed couples, especially those who are into drinking, you know, a glass or two or three or four of wine every night, that if you guys are high on alcohol, that argument is going to explode because you're not present. You're not in a place where you can hear things clearly or see things clearly. I, I, you know, we all, we, a lot of people think we live in reality. We only live in our perception of reality. And what I found that all drugs, and again, I'm a recovered addict, it, you know, we already have, all of us have this veil between our mind and reality. Okay. This perception. But if you're using any drug whatsoever, that veil is thickened greatly. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you can't hear each other. It's hard enough that they, for them when they come to me and they're arguing all the time. But if alcohol is involved, it gets worse and worse. I ask them sometimes to see if they can make a commitment, even for a few weeks, not to drink. I've been told, no, I can't do that. And then I think, well, what's the problem here? That they cannot, you know, stop drinking for just a few weeks. What else is going on here? Um, and people you know people use because they run away from their demons the things they don't want to deal with absolutely so okay i don't see drug use as the problem i see it as a symptom of the problems they're dealing with but certainly it exacerbates it okay let, let's let's uh take a moment to hear from our sponsor and because we're gonna we're not even done with this conversation with this topic i should say uh so we're gonna come right back with michelle s weber right after this moment from us this episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. Ever heard of accelerated learning techniques? What if you learned more deeply than ever before? What if you remembered what you learned far better than ever before? Visit www.perficio.io. That's perficio.io, where you can understand perhaps better than ever before. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petrozzo. We're off to a great start, of course, with Michelle S. Weber. Now, we're talking about communication right now, especially in couples. And, you know, you know, as a coach or NLP practitioner, we get into 
you know, most people communicate on the on the superficial level, on this upper level. Getting down into the deeper level is where it's at. You know, what we really want to express, what we really want to know. And yeah, you know, having a great, a better vocabulary improves that, but you've also got to be willing to express that and to receive that. And I think whether I use NLP, neuro linguistic programming, like I have done, do you have any use of that? Do you use that at all, Michelle? Or, no, yeah. no, I haven't. Yeah, but you don't need it. You don't need it. You know what you're doing. You know to get to that, to get to that deeper stuff. But that's what it's all about. Whether it be a couple, you know, like you're talking about or any other relationship, communication is where it's at. We've got to be able to hear the person. Listening is a critical thing. Not just thinking about what the next thing I'm going to say is, before you, you know. <laughs> so, but now we also, we also, we got into the uh, the drugs and I include alcohol as a drug. It's just society's favorite drug. And by the way, audience, Michelle told, you know, I'm a recovered alcoholic over a long time 22 years 35 years ago M michelle had an event she was uh can, can we, you want to talk you want to say this real briefly michelle of course oh, I, was, um, I had designed and developed very successful programs in napa valley they need some someone who was they needed someone who was licensed and i'm a licensed clinical social worker i got my license in california many years ago and my programs were running well. And I was out the night before with a big cocaine dealer and I was doing cocaine. My program was running well. I went in the next day at 2.30 in the afternoon and my staff, they were sitting around. I said, well, what are you guys doing? And my staff said, we're waiting for our leader. I said, me? They said, you were supposed to be here two and a half hours ago. That week I stopped. Caffeine, cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, and nicotine. Fantastic. All of them. And you haven't you haven't relapsed with any well. And that just goes to show, you know, we were saying before we started the interview, you know, you know, a typical addict doesn't mean forget that they quit. They just forget the why. And, and Michelle and I have agreed that she just never forgot her whys. Okay. I guess she wanted to be a great leader. I don't know. That's all subjective. Uh Go on. Let me let me tell you that I was running up until COVID, I was running groups for recovering and not so recovering addicts. And I just I fell in love with them. And initially I walked in and I said, look, I'm old enough to be your grandmother. You got to show me respect. So several of them said, Michelle, with that hair, you got our respect already. <laughs> and then I shared my story of my own drug use with them. And I said, just so you know, I've been there. And if you're doing a drug and you want to find out about it and I don't know about it, tell it to me. I'll research it. I'll talk to the people who know and I'll get back to you. So I ran groups twice a week for addicts for a lot of years and I loved it. I loved it. I got, you know, I'm an NLP practitioner. I was a certified coach. I love self-help, personal development. I'm into philosophies right now. I'm studying the meditations by Marcus Aurelius, uh, with I have my protege, I have a protege and we're studying this stuff and we're creating a course out of it simultaneously, all this stuff, great stuff. I'm all about, you know, improving myself. I've got to say, and I, this isn't the first time I've said this podcast, the most profound thing I've ever did in my life was to get clean and sober. It is the most profound thing I ever did. It is not just life-changing, it's a whole other life, whole other life than being dependent on that, but by then diluting my mind with that by oh you know, I, I you know life it's been a roller coaster i mean emotionally more or less you know because that's life's life's a bitch but i'm i'm always sharp-witted because i don't put that put anything in my body anymore and and i don't worsen any problems as we i alluded to at the beginning by with drugs <laughs> you know and i'm not i'm not looking for this this escape you know the escape is is dealing <laughs> that's the escape you solving the problem or confronting it on some level of functionality it's a whole other experience it's a whole other life yeah i mean i truly believe that drug use is not the problem it's a symptom of the problem mm -hmm. and um i like i said i always share my story and some of these guys relapsed one young woman od'd my heart was breaking breaking for her but people cannot deal sometimes with some very heavy emotional shit. Yeah. Um, sorry, that wasn't too professional. But anyway, <laughs> and, um, 
they keep running away yeah. from their demons rather than dealing with them. And they use and use and use. When, when, when I can help someone get clean and sober, we can look at what, what's going on with you. What happened? What, when did you first start using? Uh, who did you use with? What, what do you think encouraged you to use? And we do the work. You know, and if you just described introspection, and it's nothing like introspection, whether you do it by the self or you have an, an expert like yourself, uh, like like you assisting. But you know, I you know, I I I'm so I I said I spoke at an NA meeting recently because some because someone asked me to do it, and, and I'm only an inactive member at best now. And and I and I I brought up an anecdote which I hadn't said in many many years because it was. It was a bit uh, amusing for myself to re re remember this, and I'll and I'll share it now. I remember being, and I was, I used to be in the '90s. I was a businessman in Staten Island, and the chambers of commerce, sitting on the chambers of commerce. I wore a suit all day, and then at night, often I'd be in the Lower East Side in a crack up crack apartment, yeah, right? of course, smoking crack. And there was this one guy. It was his apartment. We had it with his brother, and he was. There were older guys, <clears throat> and this guy I used to call him the scientist. He had a white beard down to, almost to his his, you know, his navel and a very intelligent guy. Uh, and I called him the scientist. And I remember this conversation I had and we were both, I, you know, we were both crackheads, right? You know, and, uh, and crackheads love to talk about crack. That's what we were talking about. And, 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 uh, and he said to me, I'll never forget this, even though I had to re-remember it, but I'll never forget it until I die. He said, Tony, the only thing I, ha I had to learn about crack, I learned in the first hit, that was a million hits ago. Yeah. So there was nothing more to learn. <laughs> it was just it was just a circle, a million circles, of this thing that of looking for a corner that doesn't exist yep. in this circle. The only way out of it is to literally step metaphorically and literally step out of this circle of madness. <laughs> yep, I I agree a hundred percent. Um, there's big concerns now with fentanyl and people are ODing. Um, crystal meth is very big where I am now. In oh yeah, well, that's, when I was out there, that's what that was my what my thing was. But let's talk about mindfulness. Let's let's segue okay. in that direction because yeah, it's a big part of what you do, and I love that. What I what I often do is I simply ask myself, "What am I doing?" Which I find to be an invaluable question because a lot of times I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. You know, <laughs> and I have to, and I have to become, I have to get back into the moment because instead of working, you know, in this trance or, or just, just out of, or out of this pattern, blah, 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 instead of where am I, what am I doing, what's going on, both internally and externally, I find that to be a critically, a critical question with a, with a very useful answer. Well, when I speak to my clients about mindfulness, some of them know what it is and some of them don't. And um, you had even said it. The definition of mindfulness is being in the present moment without judgment. So a lot of the work I do is I suggest that they learn to meditate and I help them. And some of them never have. And I suggest a very quick and easy way to start. You know, set your alarm for three minutes. Just follow your breath. Thoughts are going to come up. However, Name it in your, in your head and watch it float away and go back to following your breath. And those who have practiced it are, have really started to feel a difference. Uh, we talk a lot about being very in the present moment and thinking about what you want to, how you want to respond to someone and is it going to be hurtful or is it going to be helpful? I'm also studying Buddhism, and in Buddhism, there is right speech, R-I-G-H-T. Yes. Now, I don't talk about people being doormats, and I'm not one. However, think about what you're going to say, and is it going to hurt, or is it going to help? Do you even need to say it? Mm -hmm. The other stuff we talk about is equanimity. It's a word I use. I love it. It's one of my favorite words. Good. I learned it years ago, and the example I use is a mountain. Well, the let's mountain. tell let's tell the users the definition. It means yes. to have an emotional balance and emotional stability. Well, here's the here's what I was going to do until you rudely interrupted me. Well, I, that's what I do. I'm the host. I can do that. I know that. Okay. <laughs> so think about a mountain. Now it's it's hot, scorching heat hits that mountain, freezing cold hail and snow and pouring down rain hits that mountain. But that mountain is still the same mountain. And it's our ability 
to maintain equanimity. It is what it is and it will pass. The other thing I work on is RAIN, R-A-I-N, uh, from Tara Brock, who's very big in mindfulness and brilliant and beautiful. Don't push your problems away. What you resist persists. So RAIN, if I may, R is recognize it. Okay, I'm feeling upset because of. And then say, accept it. Okay, this is where I am right now. Investigate it with kindness, not what the fuck is going on here? God did take a breath and investigate it with kindness. R A I and the N has several different meanings. Nurture it. Yeah, I've been here before. I know it's going to be all right. I always get through it. Non attach. I can let this go now because I've worked on it. Um, non attach and nurturing are really important in rain. Yeah. Let it go or you know, deal with it in a gentle way. When I say investigate with kindness, the other thing I work on with my clients is mindful self-compassion. You have to be good to yourself. Mm -hmm. And there was a training last year and we were talking about women who give and give and give. And the speaker said it so well. She said, and then your teacup is empty. You have nothing more to give, not even to yourself. The other thing about mindful self-compassion is Christian Neff developed it. It's radical mindful self-compassion because you can also say no. No to social injustice. No to being treated badly. No to not, uh, not liking what someone else is saying, but not in a way that you're attacking, in a way that you're grounded in your firm. You're not a doormat, but you are clear and you don't attack. Yes. And you take care of yourself. Excellent. I love it. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back with the fabulous Michelle S. Weber. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. When Ben Franklin arrived in Philadelphia, all he had was 10 cents in his pocket. Despite this, he became America's first self-made man. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O to actually have the knowledge and principles of Ben Franklin transferred into yourself. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having a vivacious conversation with Michelle Weber. We're just finishing up on mindfulness. And by the way, what I like to think about mindfulness is that it is the magic capability. Because when we know what's going on within and without, then we can not just take, we can have accurate decisions or, or effective decisions, but we can be effective in the world as opposed to some delusion or illusion. The other writer I love and speaker is Jack Cornfield. He's brilliant. Uh, he yeah. was in the monastery for years and he's Jewish. So he's either a Jew boo or a boo Jew. But he has a <laughs> wonderful book called, well, he's written many, A Lamp in the Darkness. And he says some, he's many wonderful things in that book. Some of the quotes I read to my clients. He said, you can't control the waves, but you can learn how to surf. In other words, you know what that means. You, you can deal with it. You can make it work. You can work it out. You don't have to get crazy and angry. And sometimes when I hear about anger that's coming out of one of my clients, I also say, look, it's not only the people around you, it's your heart rate, it's your blood pressure, it's what you're doing to yourself, and you don't even feel good when you're angry. Absolutely. And you know, uh, a, a very similar metaphor or analogy that I have to that is that the key in dealing with rough weather on the water is, is floating. Yeah, right? there you forget, go. It's forget it's about it. swimming, all right? You, there's too many forces that are much stronger. Just floating. Float, just float. You'll get to some safe point as long as you can keep water out of your lungs, and then you'll, you're you're back in the game. Flow, learn. To That's flow, the, the thing about, about mindfulness because if you really understand it, it doesn't knock you off your feet. And Pema Chodron, who's brilliant and a very kick-ass Buddhist, also has written many things, and she says the only permanence in life is impermanence. Everything's going to change. We don't know what's going to happen. Absolutely. And when it does, a lot of us, oh my God, I wasn't prepared. 
life. This is life. And it's the way for us to deal with it in the healthiest way that we possibly can. To you kind know, of flow, flow with stuff. Totally. And, you know, and to bring us to a conclusion about uh, uh, talking about addiction and recovery and mindfulness, uh, you know, I found that, you know, addiction was, is a drug way of not dealing with your feelings. But the, the, not, the non-drug way I found in my experience is obsession. That's where I, my mind would be in some circuited, so, you know, a circuit and I couldn't, you know, and I, I put itself there, but, but it was the same thing. It wasn't, there was, I didn't want to feel some feeling. So what I would ask myself is what am I trying not to feel when I found, when I found myself obsessing, which was quite often. All right. What, I would say, what am I trying not to feel? And then I could also ask myself, what do I want here? And when I did ask myself those questions, my obsession would decide, the, subside and, and diminish and, and be gone and I could deal. But that was a critical thing. That was like, that's like rain. You recognize it, you accept it, you investigate it with kindness and you nurture it or you let it go, non-attach. Um, the, the thing about, I, I, I have a lot of adolescents in, in my practice too and yes. I love them madly. And um, I help them. How do you work with them? Oh, I'll give you an example. I have a 14 year old who's the love of my life. She was having some emotional issues. So her mom said, you know, what I see or everything I do now is virtual. I said, of course, but she wouldn't. She kept saying no. Finally, her mom convinced her to meet me one time online. I said, sweetheart, why were you so reluctant? 14. Because all adults think that they can boss me around. They're all the boss of me. I don't want another boss. I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'm not the boss of you. You're not the boss of me. We're equal here. I learned from you. You learn from me. Let's work together for four weeks. And if you have felt that you're not getting anywhere, I've been bossing you around, you tell me. So at the end of the fourth week, I said, well, how, how's it going for you? And she said, Michelle, I love you so much. My friends would love you. And then this 14-year-old girl said to a 76-year-old woman, you're my peer. I had tears. She said, you are my peer. And I thanked her for that. I love her. So you, so you meet them where they're at. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, she, you know, adolescents go through phases where they hate their mothers. I was there, too, with my yeah. daughter. So one week she was very, I said, what? She said, she wants me to clean my room. I said, oh, isn't that horrible? My God, she wants you to clean your room. I said, I said, look, it's her house. It's her rules. And I know her mother, she's wonderful. I said, just take some baby steps. Just like, I don't know, reorganize your closet and let her see it. So the next week she took her computer and showed me her entire room. She had set up stuff. The books were in order. The bed was... I said, terrific. She said, yeah, now my mom and I are fine. I said, good job. That's great. You know, uh, I'm still stuck in my edible phase and I'm 57 tomorrow. So ah. I don't know. What... <laughs> That's great. Now, you now, okay. So you meet kids, adolescents, basically where they're at. Let's, let's uh, turn a, a bit of a corner and deal with something that's rather ubiquitous. Uh, you work with anxiety a lot and you help your clients yeah. with anxiety. And I'm sure that that, that's the gambit of demographics. Uh, what's your general approach? In okay, anxiety? so first of all, who doesn't have anxiety? I share with my clients, I get anxious. We all get anxious. Mm. Something that's really, really important from mindfulness and Carl Jung, who was a brilliant, brilliant yeah. psychologist who I loved. He's almost as good as me, Jung. Maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe. So... Very important is clients' negative voices. Mm. I can't, it will never happen. I won't do it. it. I can't handle it. So I always have them be aware of their negative voices. I had one young woman, I was helping her in her job search and she goes, I'm going to get there. They're going to treat me terribly. Nothing's going to work. I said, oh, I didn't know you were a fortune teller. So <laughs> as long as you know that's going to happen, just go and start. And she started to laugh. I said, can't, won't, never is blocking your path. The other thing you talked to me about, Tony, was your mind and how it goes. Well, in Buddhism, it's called monkey mind. Yes. We all have it. Absolutely. And when, and I meditate, well, when I meditate, Michelle, if I can get a few moments of silence, it's a massive victory. 
the speaker at one of my mindfulness classes, he was amazing. He talked about monkey mind. Now get this visual. He compared it to a monkey in heat who's been stung by a bee. <laughs> Look at that freaking monkey. Yeah. So your mind is ruminating. And Thich Nhat Hanh, who just passed, brilliant Buddhist, he said, stop and just follow your breath. You don't have to carry it around with you like an instrument. It's always with you. And I have clients that have said, yeah, Michelle, I was sitting at my desk at work. I started to feel pretty anxious and nobody knew. I just sat there and I breathed in and I breathed it. It's magic. It's your breath. It's part of you. It slows you down if you're feeling anxious. And this takes a while. This doesn't happen overnight, right? But the more we practice with being in the present moment, not living in fear, listening to our negative voices, like somebody spills something and says, to them, that was stupid. No, it wasn't. You spilled something about not beating yourself up and following your breath when you feel anxious. Yeah, that breath is, breath is life. Who knew this? I mean, really? You know, I, I, ha I mentioned I had a protege. I don't say this for any self-aggrandizing because I, I say it because you're going to get a kick out of this little story. And, uh, and he's a Buddhist. And uh, I had a podcast prior to this. I paused it because I'm focused on my company, Auxilium, which is going to transform self-help once we launch our app, Proficio. Okay, enough of that. And so I, and now I have this podcast, which is Auxilium's, well, it's related to Auxilium's podcast, which is all about, you know, business excellence and personal development, of which hopefully you're both, but certainly you're about personal development. And so we, in that previous podcast, podcast we, we, one of the things we touched on every episode was we, we went into the Tao Te Ching. We talked about Buddhism. We talked about Zen. And, 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 and I've always, I've long been interested in Zen, but I've never studied it, you know, directly or, or you know, with, when I, you know, I wasn't very studious about it. But this guy made me, my, made me his mentor because I just have this proclivity for it, this instinct for, for Zen. And I don't say this, you know, to be, to him press anybody but it just it's so natural to me to understand that all the problems that we have in life 99 perhaps 99.9 .9 percent are all between our ears and we can just relax and go with the flow take it easy see things as as they are as best we can as right. best we can now, don't don't fight that's the ego don't defend that's the ego whenever you find yourself doing that that's your ego which is not even who we really are that's just a construction <laughs> you know, whoever i think i am i'm more than that what you're saying is is really important because what i also do with my friends my clients myself and i'll use myself as an example i do that a lot with my clients if somebody has an issue with me Please don't come at me with you, you, you. I will back up. I, will, I won't right. be able to feel. But this is about healthy communication. When you said this to me, this is how I felt. Right. When you were, it changes everything. Absolutely. So the other person doesn't feel attacked. And with everything going on in this country, in this world, which could make all of us who are very compassionate, like yours truly, Pema Chodron talks about finding peace inside yourself because that's going to help. That, that was critical. You know, I, you know, I was an addict and, and I was at war with myself and I, and I had such animosity towards the world, of course, coming from within. And if you, back then, if you could have showed me where the doomsday button was, I would have broke my finger pressing it. That's how much animosity I had towards the world. Which of course came from within. Now, well, Tony, you know, Tony, drugs exacerbate that. Totally, totally. Uh, but but I, you know, my genesis, and I, and I say this without any blame, of my addiction was because my father left home. And my father just did the best he could with the resources he had at the time, like everyone does. I, you know, and I had to forgive him, even though he did his best. But for a, for, for a kid, I was abandoned. That was my understanding of the situation, and my sadness became a rage. Okay. Uh, and so, and then I dealt with it. And so, but now, so instead of being at war with myself in the world, now I'm at peace <laughs> with myself in the world. So now I have peace. And that is a critical thing because with, with this degree, a reasonable degree of serenity, which is what I have, 
life is very, very, very different. <laughs> Let me share a quick story with you. Please. It was a couple of years ago. I was driving in LA. There was a woman in front of me who pulled her car to the right. So I started to go. She pulled her car to the right because she wanted to make a very wide left turn. And I had to slam on my brakes or I would have hit her. She backed up with her window closed, giving me the middle finger, calling me every name in the book. And I thought, okay, let me give this a try. So I opened my window as she continues to swear at me. And I said, you know what? What? And I had never said a bad word to her. I don't do that anymore. I did it years ago. Um, I said, we're both women. We, we don't need to fight like this. I said, we, I wasn't fighting. And she went, oh, yeah, right. I'm so sorry. And I almost said, wait a minute, what? <laughs> he said, great, me too. I had done nothing wrong. And she said, have a good day. I thanked her. And when I went to run my group, I said to the guys, can you imagine if I had opened my window and started swearing back at her? One, how I would have felt. And two, how I would have felt when I walked in to run the group. Well, you found the commonality very quickly. But you know what I've done for a very long time? But I drive less and less these days. Uh, but I, when, I, when I, a road rager flips me off, what, I, what I've always done well, for a very long time is I just blow them kisses. <laughs> I just blow them kisses. <laughs> you know, I never, I never give someone the finger that, you know, again, I, attacking and defending is the ego. I, I want, I want to become enlightened. I'm on a road of enlightenment. But I want to make it clear to our audience that we're not doormats. We stand up for what we believe, but we don't attack. We don't call people's names. We, oh, it not only right. upsets the other person, but it's what it does to us emotionally. Yes, and physically. yes. Absolutely. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll be right back with Michelle S. Weber. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. People start something, then something comes up or they need a break or even a vacation and they often never get back on track. Perficio is designed to allow all of this. Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can live your life as you learn and make progress toward your life-changing goals. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza, and the giggling Michelle S. Weber. Michelle just laughed a little bit at, at my gestures during the commercials. I like to do that with my guests because uh, I'm so enjoying this conversation, truly. It is really so I think valuable for the listener, but very and very interesting and valuable for me too. I'm but I'm very uh, entertained by it, but not in a you know in a aloof way. And just that this is a very pleasant conversation. I want to share one more thing about mindfulness, if I Please. might. There's a marvelous center. It's still it's Zoom now because we were going every Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, but with COVID it closed. It's called Insight LA. I-N-S-I-G-H-T-L-A. I send my clients there if they're inclined. There are classes on learning about mindfulness. There's meditation groups. There's what they call Dharma talks, which are talks to enlighten you and help you and help you deal with stuff. And several of my clients have signed up for courses and they say it's amazing because then you're in a community of like people who are looking for the same kind of stability and some peace in their lives and a better understanding of right speech and ethical behavior. It's a great place. I also, every group I ran for recovering addicts, we started off with a guided meditation run by me. It's great. Um, and very, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, I volunteered for the AIDS project in the East Bay in the late eighties when we didn't even know what it was. We went through a three day training this is on my website and there was a young three men that were diagnosed and we felt so badly for them. But one man had a horrible attitude. He was mean, he was nasty and his name was Richard. We all said goodbye and the clinical director was gonna call us to assign us clients. He said, I have your first client. I said, great. His name is Richard. I said, no, <laughs> I said, no, he's mean, he's angry, he's sexist. I said, Michelle, please, he needs a strong woman. So I thought and thought and I said, no, she said, I said, wait a minute. They paid for my training. They really taught me so much and I'm gonna tell them no. So I said, okay, I'll meet him once just to make sure we can work together because he's nasty. 
She said, by the way, I want you to know there's some, been some domestic violence involved. I said, oh, what am I, great. Well, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story because it goes on and on. But we first met in Berkeley at a cafe. He was in a suit and tie. He pulled out my chair for me. It was one of the best and healthiest relationships I've ever had from a client. It was 1987. I got a Christmas card because I said I wouldn't work with him because he was a sexist pig. The card was to, uh, oh, he wouldn't work with me because I was a pushy broad. Me, pushy? So the card was to a pushy broad from a sexist pig. Michelle, thank you, thank you. I love our work together, yada, yada. The year comes to an end. The panel is up there again, three same guys. What did you learn? You know, And he said, I learned to deal with my feelings because I was working with Michelle and we we're all crying. The year comes to an end. I go back to the East Coast for medical reasons. He goes to Arizona with an ex-girlfriend because he was not gay and he was proud of the fact he picked up HIV and AIDS from hookers. Every Sunday he would call me and his voice was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And one Sunday he said, I can't do this anymore. I said, then don't. And a few days later, his girlfriend called and said he passed. I, and he wanted um, to make sure I knew, you know, how thankful he was for our relationship. And a few days later, I changed my license plate to Pushy Broad in his honor. And I've had that license plate for, I don't know, 40 years. That was a great anecdote. You know, I think that's a big problem today is that political differences, people are putting, are, are making, Mo, you know, mountains into you know molehills into mountains. Yeah, well, we all have political differences. Is that a reason not to at least have a discourse? I understand. But, you know, we if we the more we talk, speak about, it, the more we'll find we have in common. We can have political differences. That doesn't mean we have to be in conflict. At least, uh, you know, at least uh, not be friends or uh, threaten people because they don't like their beliefs. Absolutely, it's, it's you know, gotten bad. So I have to make sure that I don't let what's going on in our country take me over so that I can't be good to myself and my friends. And it isn't easy. I always tell this to my clients. I said, I have to practice what I preach. Don't think I'm the queen of this. I'm not, but it's helping me and I'm sharing it with you. Absolutely. You know, and I, by the way, I can th I just know from seeing you and speaking to you that you're, that you're a huge Trump supporter. So I can, <laughs> I, and, I, and I say that just to be funny, just, just to I be know. Funny. But, but no, I think you can't get any more left than me, <laughs> right? Um, I work with a lot of women in treatment too. I ran a therapy referral service for women at Yale many years ago. I see a lot of women in treatment. We do a lot of work. And I'm always ready for feedback. If you felt the last session wasn't what you needed it to be, or I didn't hear you, you got to tell me. I tell that to my adolescents too, so that they know I'm hearing them. Let's let's uh, end our, our interview with this with this uh, this topic, uh, comedy, uh, humor. To me, I mean, that, to me, that's one of my greatest qualities: being funny, having a sense of humor, even considered making a course about it and and I, I think i'm a very funny person and i want to be i want to always find the funny angle in everything that doesn't mean it's that doesn't mean i got it's time to cut a joke but look for the angle because i benefit from it i benefit from it and i strive to express myself when you know as long as it's not too inappropriate yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know they're, they're, you know like part of comedy is being inappropriate but sometimes right. you got to hold your tongue right uh, my father i i think i said was a stand-up comedian and yes. singer yes he yes was, i mean the things he would do were outright we'd go through the toll booth he'd have a piece of bubble gum on his nose and the toll guy got so hysterically passed him through we didn't have to pay the toll but that's on my website as well i always use humor i oh. always help people to laugh Comedy is one of my gods. I love it. I, I, that you know, to me, one of the great diseases today that afflicts the world is the disease of taking ourselves too seriously. You got to take yourself seriously, you know, because there's things to do, and people need to trust you. But taking yourself too seriously is a disease, and you get depressed. Absolutely, absolutely. When everything's not just like just the way you want it. You know, oh, then comes the, you know, the moroseness and the I'm so sullen and the depression and then the suicide ideation, <laughs> you know, and maybe I'm, that's actually, uh, that, that happens, that happens, way too happen, 
way too often, quite frankly. I've, you know, I've been suicidal. I had a gun to my head in the 90s that my hand was holding the, the grip of. Is that when you were using? Yes, yes. Of course. But I was staying away from it, but the psychic pain I was in That's was right. so great. Was so great. That's right. It, and uh, but taking you know finding the funny side to things is is something I always strive to do, and I always try to impart that to people. It doesn't mean that you have to cut a joke, but look for it because it frees you up from this moroseness. We have a lot of humor in my sessions. I mean, we really end up laughing, and it's wonderful. We don't laugh at heavy stuff, but we laugh together. Humor is so important. Oh, critical, critical. They say that it's the best medicine. You know what? It's, it, it's also the best maintenance. Oh, it's, of course. You know, it's it's like it's like a physical training, but for your mind. You yeah. Know, it keeps your mind limber, keeps it loose, keeps it, you know, it's not, it does, it prevents a mental atrophy, at least on an emotional side, where you're able to, again, to look, looking for the lighter side of things, looking for the funny angle, gets the mind moving, frees it up. I love it. I love, I mean, I, I love being this way. So I think it's one of the greatest things about myself, one of my greatest assets. And I think that I encourage everyone to strive to be more humorous, or at least to find the funny side. Michelle, you have been a wonderful guest. How do people uh, get a hold of you, find you on the internet? Well, yeah, my, um, website is michelleweber.com and it's two L's in Michelle and two B's in Weber. M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-W-E-B-B-E-R.com. And on social media, it's uh, at Redhead Slim, right? On Instagram. Yeah, Redhead Slim, yeah. Right. Instagram, and Instagram with my face painted. Although everybody is urging me to get back on Instagram. I really don't use it, but I need to. And on Facebook, you're at Michelle Weber LCSW. Yeah, right, so absolutely. I I encourage everyone to go to michelleweber.com. She, she does virtual stuff. So, you know, that's the way to go. Uh, you have any, uh, you've been a great guest. Such so lovely to speak with you and, and engage with you. Do you have any final remarks for the audience? No, I just want people to know that this was absolutely wonderful. And you are the bomb. I am a bomb. I'm going to blow up soon. <laughs> you have really worked on yourself. And I think that's a great role model for so many men. I, I am committed to personal development. I always strive to be the better me. That's what I'm all about. That's why I'm here. I mean, I'm 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 here to I'm here to, to express my individu individuality, become the better me, and also balance it out quite necessarily with being a team player. It's not yeah. all about Tony Petroza. Let me no, know. No. What can Absolutely. I give? What can I contribute? Uh, it's Michelle, the way we thank, work with people. Thank you so thank you much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. I want everyone to remember we're all responsible for ourselves and we can all use a little help. With that, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Michelle, so much for joining me. We'll see you at the next episode of the Self-Help Coaching Podcast. Bye, sweetheart. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.